Networks and diagrams can start off really easy, but soon it gets more difficult and more difficult and things get complicated. How do we break out of this system? When deciding whether graphs are isomorphic or not, you have to check whether the edges are crossing and the labels. You have to check these two things very carefully. For example, the graphs may look completely identical, except the labels are switched around. In that case, it would be non-isomorphic. On the other hand, graphs may look completely different and they have edges that cross, but if you uncross and redraw the graph, they have the same connections and the same labels showing each connection, making these graphs isomorphic. This leads me to the second error in networks and diagrams that you might come across, is when you're counting the faces of each network, make sure that the edges are all not crossing each other. For example, if it's a square that has an edge that crosses like this, this does not mean that there is one, two, three, four faces. When you uncross them, it will actually have only three, one, two, three. So what does that mean for non-planar graphs where you can't draw them without crossing the edges? So that means you cannot count the faces of a non-planar graph. So make sure that the graph is planar before counting the faces. Now, when you're drawing a graph based on an activity table, you have to make sure that all of your connections are present. So if you miss a singular connection, and go chronologically, start from the first uh, connection point to the last connection point and don't skip anything because if you skip one thing you'll probably have to redraw the entire rest of the graph that you made the mistake upon. When you're drawing your directed graphs based off an activity table always make sure to have a starting vertex and an ending vertex and then you also want to have no multiple edges between the vertices so if you have a vertex here and another vertex here you can't have a line more than one line going from this to this if you want to have that um, when the activity table tells you to then you have to add a dummy activity so from here to here you add another dummy activity maybe somewhere up here so then there'll be a dummy line going up here and then back down here this is so that there won't be any computational errors when especially calculating float times and things it gets a bit tricky if there are multiple um, lines going through each vertex and that's just incorrect and the vcar site design tells you to add dummy activities as well so this leads me to the next question which is about flow questions where you have um, things that are flowing in a direction particular direction look at the arrow directions really carefully like just because there's like a bunch of arrows going this direction there can always be some arrows pointing the opposite direction and then it ends up just floating over your mind when you're drawing your minimum spanning trees, make sure everything is connected. This is a really small thing, but sometimes when you're drawing these minimum spanning trees, on, especially on top of the diagram, then you can sometimes not end up not connecting the whole tree together, which is what I accidentally did for one of my practice questions. So just don't do that. Now in critical path questions where you're looking at LSTs, ESTs, float times, all those things, make sure you consider the entire graph together because in these critical path and activity questions you have to look at the entire graph otherwise you may miss out on some small details that could either make the float time even longer or shorter so consider all the pathways that could be occurring now this question is from the vcar 2022 exam exam two and it is question two that's a lot of twos i know but anyways so we have a project type question where it's a diet graph and question 2a says, how many of these activities have two immediate predecessors? So when I think predecessors, I think it's best to start from the end and then go that way to the start. So if we look at the first activity, which is on the right, sorry, is J. And as you can see, there is two things connected, which means that J is one of the activities that has an immediate predecessor. Then we check I. And as you can see, there's a connection here and a connection here. So that's uh, another activity that has a predecessor. And it's really hard to see if this one actually has two predecessors because there's a curve and people don't really see that curve that much. And with activity H as well, it has two predecessors as well. And as we go through the graph, you can double check if there's any other predecessors where there's um, two predecessors, sorry. And there is not, so it's just these three. One, two, three, so three activities. What is the minimum completion time in weeks for this project? So when it comes to uh, completion time and weeks, 
and minimum, that means we have to find the critical path. So to find the critical path, we should start systematically from the first activity, and that is 10. And then we trial and error for all of these activities. So 10 plus 3 is 13, 13 plus 7 is 20, 20 plus 2 is 22, 22 plus 4 is 26. I'm pretty sure there's a longer one right here. 10 plus 7 is 17, 7 plus 5 is 22, 25, 29. So if we go here and then this is actually the same path so we're gonna skip straight to 22 and then if we go down here it actually goes to 30 and that is all the available paths that we have so and since this is the longest yeah, I know it says minimum completion time but the thing is you have to complete all the activities so the minimum completion time is indeed 30 weeks so that's a mistake that people tend to get tripped up on is when they say minimum completion time, oh, that means it's 26. But no, you have to count for all the activities to be completed. Because as you can see in the question, it says this project requires 10 activities to be completed, which means all of it has to be completed. And thus the longest path is the minimum completion time. Now we have part C of the question, which is probably the hardest part because it's involving crashing, which is a bit of um, hard to look at. Well, it's still fine. So we can reduce the completion time of two activities. One can be reduced by two weeks and the other can be reduced by one week. These two changes result in the overall project project being reduced by three weeks. So if we remember what our critical path was, which is the longest path, it goes here and then here and then here. And it also goes around here and that gives us a total of 30 weeks. But if we look at the next long, the next longest, is just straight here and that is 29 so as we can see the difference here is 8 whereas going straight led a 7 so if we reduce i to 7 which is a reduction of one week then we can reduce the overall critical path or the overall minimum completion time to 20 so that means we do activity i and that will be a one week reduction and then what else can we do to reduce this overall completion time? So right now it's 29 and I is 7. Well, obviously this start right here at start A, activity A, we can reduce this however much we want and it'll reduce the entire thing because it's the start and everything is connected starting from A. So we can put in A, activity A, and reduce it by two weeks. And if that's two weeks, that means A10 becomes A8. And therefore the overall re reduction time, overall completion time is now 27. So 30 minus 27 is indeed three weeks. So this is our final answer. So we have a question from the Cambridge textbook and we're just gonna be doing question D for now, just question D. What is the minimum cost that will achieve the greatest reduction in time taken to complete the project? And this is given the information that activity F, so that's activity F right here, can be reduced by a maximum of three days at a cost of $100 per day. So the thing is, the maximum will end up costing three times 100, so $300. So if we use up the $300, it actually might not be necessary and we could end up being wasting money. We could end up be wasting money. So we need to find the minimum cost. So what I'll do here is find the critical parts for each path. So 4 plus 9 plus 1 is 14. 5 plus 5 plus 3 is 13. 6 plus 7 plus 3 is 16. So the critical path is 16. And as we can see, F lies on that critical path. So what is the second longest critical path? And that is 14. And as we can see, activity F is not on this um, second longest path, which means that if we reduce F three times, it's not going to be effective because the next longest path is 14. So if we do two times, it will be 16 minus two, which equals 14. And that is the, that is the maximum reduction that we could ever have. So therefore F can be reduced twice for two days. So two times $100 equals $200. So that means the minimum cost is $200 to achieve the greatest reduction in time taken to complete the project. This question is a flow question which was actually on my exam last year and I actually ended up taking a long time to do it 
well there's actually a much faster way to do this type of question so <clears throat> we're wondering what the capacity of the minimum cut would be so you're probably familiar with this but using the minimum cut strategy where you cut across the thing and you look for the minimum so we can go down here 12 plus 10 plus 8 is 30 this may or may not be the minimum cut then we have 7 plus 4 plus 12 and as you can see there's arrows pointing backwards and as i said before we, we don't we want to make sure that we see this and don't add this to our minimum cut so that was a 7 plus a 4 plus 12 which is 23 and that looks like the minimum cut so far and let me double check 8 plus 10 plus 12 is also going to be 30 and then going here would give a massive cut so the minimum cut is 23 so that is option b now question 40 this is the one that took a longer time to do where you can do one of these changes from a to e and one of them will lead to the largest increase in flow so what we can do to actually target this strategy is apply the change manually one by one from a b c d e and then test out different minimum cuts and see which one gets the biggest the largest minimum cut and i think on the exam i was just doing it manually but as we know the the way we got to this um option the way we derived 23 for question 39 b is if we go down here eight seven eight this seven is what contributes to it then we have this other path 10 4 4 8 10 that's uh four contributes to that so seven plus four and then we have 12 12 so seven plus four plus 12 gives us that 23 so that's where it's derived from so now we can go on to question 40 and let's try option a increase the capacity of flow along ce to 12 so we go to ce which let me just erase this so ce is down here so we're going to change this from 4 to 12. initially it looks like it might be a massive change because we're going from 4 to 12 that's a plus 8 but we have to remember we're using the minimum cut strategy here so if we go here that's not going to give us the minimum cut anymore so we we'll probably go down 8 plus 4 plus 12 and that's going to give us 24 which is actually really small so option a gives us 24 which is only a uh, additional one now b is increasing the capacity along fh to 14 so let's check fh and make it 14 fh is here 14 now this has no effect because as we saw we go 7 4 12 so that has no effect it would stay as 23 because it's not on our minimum cut line and uh, next thing for c is uh, increasing the capacity of flow of gh to 16. so let's check gh gh to 16. this might actually increase the flow but i don't think it's going to be dramatic or anything so let's check 7 plus 4 plus 12 i mean 16. it's 27 so 27 that's an increase of four now these last two options are reversing the direction which i think are pretty interesting so let's go ahead and do those reverse the direction along cf so cf is here and we're going to go change that arrow to go this way it's going to 10 and then to the 12. so 7 plus 10 plus 12 is 29 so that's 29 which is going to be an additional plus six okay and then we're going to check the last option which is the reverse the direction along the line gf so we're going to go here and switch the direction this way that looks like it would give a um big result so that means we're forced to go this way but that is also another big result which means that this is probably going to be the minimum cut and that is 12 plus 10 is 8 is 30. so that 
30 is now a plus seven increase. So therefore the answer is E. And unfortunately, after doing trial and error, we get E, which is the last option, which means we took a long time. But the thing is, this was the last question on the exam. And usually they'll put all the hard questions at the end, which is pretty good for us. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you want, I can make more walkthrough videos of particular VCAR questions from past exams. Just like, subscribe, and comment down the particular question that you want to make a walkthrough video of. Thank you for watching.